Welcome to the podcast, Crime Salad, where we talk true crime. I'm your host, Ashley, and with me always is my husband and partner in crime, Ricky. The purpose of this podcast is to honor the victims through ethical storytelling in the hopes of preventing future tragedies. We want our stories to resonate and educate others in hopes that some of these similar cases with identifiable patterns can be prevented. Now, before we jump in, please let us warn you that this is a true crime podcast. The details of this episode may be triggering to some listeners. Listener discretion advised. In the digital age of dating, where social media platforms and dating apps are a common way to meet and interact with new people, sometimes we can forget that they often come with hidden dangers. It's much easier to stumble into unsavory elements and aspects you might escape with traditional dating, such as getting to know people through face-to-face interactions, where we're able to pick up red flags a bit easier. Before the convenience of online dating, singles often met through friends, family, work, school, social clubs, social events, and even bars and restaurants. You would get to know each other organically through conversation and sharing stories. And you may have known this, but Ricky and I started dating back in 2008 when we connected through MySpace, something we both were very hesitant to tell people at the time because back then, online dating was new and not as common. And it's no wonder in our current busy and connected world that internet dating has surged in popularity in recent years, largely due to the convenience it offers in our increasingly busy lives. The ability to connect with a broad range of people from all walks of life at any time from anywhere is a powerful draw. A person is no longer limited to their immediate geographical area when selecting a dating partner. In today's modern age, you could meet and fall in love with someone on the other side of the state, country, or world. Well, in 2007, Sadie Beckham's life intertwined with Zach Anderson's when they crossed paths in a traditional setting, out with mutual friends. Not long after they were sharing a home and celebrating the birth of their first child, a daughter they named Olivia. But their relationship, marked by constant turbulence, was a series of breakups and makeups. By 2012, they were no longer living together. Zach's job, which required him to travel extensively across the state, was a significant factor in his inconsistent presence as a boyfriend. Despite his infidelity, Sadie always found it in her heart to give him another chance each time he showed up at her doorstep. The birth of twin boys, eight years after Olivia, was a new chapter in their tangled story. However, a monumental argument in late 2019 proved to be the breaking point. Zach's presence in Sadie's home and his role as a father became non-existent. He was banned from visiting his children and ceased to provide child support. The children's lives continued without any interaction with their father for several months. But all of this silence was shattered when Zach learned that Sadie had ventured into the dating world. Ironically, Zach had been in a secret relationship with a woman named Christine Remsberg for the past year. Yet the news of Sadie's new love interest incited a feeling of possession over her. Zach's temper flared at the thought of another man in Sadie's life or the lives of his children. His demeanor shifted towards irrationality and control as he obsessively sought details about his new rival for Sadie's affections. By February of 2020, Sadie was finally ready to move on with her life and turn to Facebook dating. On February 13th, 2020, she met a man by the name of Rosalio Gutierrez Jr. Sometimes he went by Leo, and sometimes he was referred to as Jr. He lived about 30 minutes from Sadie in the Wood Creek Apartments in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Sadie wasn't ready to introduce anyone to her children, so she arranged her dates to occur when Zach had visitation. According to Olivia, who was 12 years old at the time, her father used the time he was supposed to spend with his children stalking her mother. He had purchased listening devices and multiple phones and used his daughter and neighbors to keep track of Sadie. 
And also, there was a young child who lived across the street from Sadie who would tell Zach when there was a strange car in Sadie's driveway. He used manipulation to assemble a group of spy kids to his eyes and ears. Eventually, that wouldn't be enough for him. On April 24th of 2020, Zach had visitation with all three of his children. As soon as his four-year-old twins were asleep, he left them home alone. And he and Olivia crept up to Sadie's home and began peeking through the blinds. There they saw Sadie and Rosalio cuddled on the couch together watching a movie. He became enraged that Sadie was having another man sleep over in her house. He began calling Sadie a slut and a whore and did his best to convince his daughter that her mother was betraying them both. He broke into Rosalio's truck and stole some of his documents out of the glove department with his full name and address. He also took a photo of Rosalio's insurance card and registration, a photo that would later be found on his phone. Before leaving, Zach rang Sadie's doorbell to wake up the couple and terrorize them. When Sadie answers the door, she saw a black car speeding away, and she suspected right away it belonged to her ex-boyfriend. There was another occasion when Sadie was out on a date and Zach had Olivia use her key to let him into Sadie's home. Again, he left the twins at home alone sleeping. This time he placed a listening device in the air vents in Sadie's home. He told Olivia her mother wasn't a good person and he was trying to limit her time with his children. He said he would need evidence in a custody battle to continue their relationship. He also gave Olivia a secret cell phone and instructed her to record any time her mother became upset or yelled at her. At the same time, he began a campaign to get Sadie back under his control. He began telling her he loved her and calling her Sadie Bear in text messages. When his insincere expressions of love didn't work, he would call her names and disparage her, telling her she was a whore and referring to Rosalio with racial slurs directed at his Hispanic ancestry. On one occasion, he told her that she had found a, quote, Down syndrome-looking Mexican version of your father. And he told her not to kiss his children so he wouldn't give them sexually transmitted diseases. He would alternate different forms of emotional abuse and coercive tactics to get Sadie back under his control. He did all of this while engaged in a long year relationship where he slept over at his girlfriend's home four to five nights a week. He didn't want Sadie, but he also didn't want anyone else to have Sadie. Most of all, he didn't want Sadie to be happy. Later, he would use this exact phrase and tell a friend that Sadie was too happy without him and he needed to put a stop to it. His original plan to stop it was to love bomb Sadie with sweet words, attention, and affection. And this has always worked for him in the past. And he was becoming frustrated when it didn't work this time. This would cause him to shift between two extremes to keep her off balance and create an environment of fear and dependence. He did his best to undermine her self-confidence and make her dependent on him for validation. Instead of apologizing, he would blame her for his extreme mood shifts, telling her she forced him to speak to her so cruelly and call her names. When his manipulation failed to work, he began actively stalking both her and Rosalio. He had told Olivia that he had planned to follow Rosalio home one day just for fun to see where he lived. When Sadie discovered that Rosalio's truck had been broken into, she immediately suspected it was her ex. She confided in a friend she believed that Zach was stalking her and spying on her, but she just couldn't prove it. She didn't understand how he always seemed to know who she was with and where she was going. So she began to suspect that there was a tracker on her car. She tore her car apart, but she couldn't find anything. In a text message, she decided to give Rosalio her ex's address and phone number. In the same text message exchange, the two talked about Rosalio going over to his home and teaching him a lesson. She told him since Zach knew where he lived, it was only fair that he knew where Zach lived too. For a few minutes, they both talked about the ways Rosalio and a friend could threaten and harm Zach all in the name of teaching him a lesson. Then Rosalio instructed Sadie to delete their text messages, which she did. Two days later, on April 26, 2020, 
Rosalio's phone placed him at Zach's address. But there was never a confrontation between the two men. Sadie had had enough of the harassment and asked Zach to meet her at the sandwich shop to discuss their children. Zach came with flowers, believing that this was a reconciliation. He was wrong. Instead, Sadie presented him with papers with a proposed visitation schedule with their children. She no longer wanted Zach to control when and where he saw the kids. Instead, Sadie was establishing healthy boundaries and was also carving out time alone when she could actively pursue other romantic relationships. Instead, Zach only wanted to talk about getting back together. A week later, Sadie discovered that Zach had Olivia spying on him for him. Olivia had gone through her mother's phone and read some of the text messages she exchanged with Rosalio to her father. Olivia was angry with her mother and felt like she was cheating on her father. Obviously, a notion that Zach had put into Olivia's head. Zach recorded a phone call between him and Sadie that lasted for one hour and 33 minutes. Sadie had no idea she was being recorded. During the call, Zach told Sadie she was destroying the family and ruining their children. He begged her to take him back and fix their family. While Zach had their children, Sadie continued dating Rosalio and began spending the night at his apartment. When she stayed over, she would get text messages from Zach confronting her for not being home and asking why her car wasn't in her driveway. At this point, she knew that Zach was actively stalking her. After one date, Zach told Sadie that he had a premonition and knew that someone was at her home. He was able to describe exactly what she was wearing and the exact music that they had been listening to as well. He was also able to describe her date with complete accuracy. Later, she would discover that Zach had taken a photo of her and Rosalio through a window without her knowledge. Zach explained that he just, quote, had to know about his competition. On another occasion, while Sadie was driving to Rosalio's house, she began getting texts from Zach that he knew exactly where she was heading. She decided to pull over once again and look for a tracking device. Instead, she found a phone hidden underneath her four-year-old's booster seat. When she confronted Zach, he said that it was just an accident and he had been looking for the phone. Then he began gaslighting her, telling her she was crazy and paranoid. Yet, just that morning, he installed the Find My iPhone app on his home computer so that he could track both the phone and Sadie's whereabouts. That same evening, while at Rosalio's home, watching a movie, she commented on the movie. At that exact same moment, Zach texted her, repeating the same phrase she had just made. She knew somewhere that Zach had placed a listening device, either on her phone or in Rosalio's apartment. Zach's phone in the weeks prior showed him at Rosalio's home several times. Now, while Sadie and Rosalio weren't exclusive, she was hopeful that their relationship was moving in that direction. In mid-May, Rosalio asked Sadie if she wanted to come over for ice cream and to meet his children. She went over immediately and was touched by this gesture. To Sadie, this meant that the two were headed in a more serious direction especially because Sadie had yet to allow him to meet her children. She was waiting for the two to take their relationship exclusive. Feeling emboldened by meeting his children, Sadie did something out of character. She texted Rosalio and told him that she had very strong feelings for him and was ready for this to be exclusive. She wanted to know how he felt about moving their relationship to the next level. Sadie was met with cold silence. And this was unusual for their relationship as Rosalio made it a habit to text each morning and each evening before he went to bed. The entire next day, she didn't hear from him. That was May 17th, 2020. The next day, May 18th, she also failed to hear from him. She texted him a few more times, but never received a response. She even tried calling him and her calls went straight to voicemail. 
She turned to her original form of communication, which was Facebook, hoping he would answer. She tried sending him a direct message and placing a Facebook call. Again, there was no response and no answer. It was the middle of the pandemic, and she began to grow concerned for him. What if he was ill and couldn't take care of himself? Sadie dropped her two youngest children off at daycare and decided to drive over to Rosalio's home and perform a welfare check on him. When she arrived at his apartment complex, the first thing she noticed was that both of his cars were in their assigned spaces. As she approached his unit, she noticed his patio door was open, which she could see as she approached from the parking lot. Thoughts had to have been racing through her head at this point. Him not answering his phone for a few days, and now the patio door that seemed to be left open, it came off as unusual. She had a feeling something was wrong. She was on the phone with her friend as she continued her approach. She called out to him through the open door. The blinds were closed, however, she assumed he would hear her through the open door. There was no response. Her friend suggested that she go around the main door and knock. As she approached the main entrance, she noticed brown stains on the door frame and on the wall. Sadie tried to open the door but found that it was locked. As she raised her hand to knock a second time, she began noticing brown dots all over the front door. She got a sick feeling and it felt like she might pass out. She backed away and went back to the way that she first approached, near the back sliding glass door. With the urgency in her friend's voice, she pushed back the blinds inside the sliding glass door and was shocked at what she saw. All of the furniture had been moved and pushed towards the walls. There was a large pool of blood all over the apartment and a large area rug was missing. As the gravity of the situation sunk in, she freaked out, hung up on her friend, and called 911. She immediately began worrying about her children. Her gut told her that Zach was involved. She called her daycare to confirm that her children were still there and safe. When the first officers arrived, she discovered that Rosalio was missing. Later, his phone and wallet would be found, hidden in the back of his freezer. Officers would later say they identified seven separate and distinctive events which occurred inside the apartment. There were also wood fragments all over the place which were consistent with a baseball bat. When officers asked Sadie if she knew of anyone who might want to harm Rosalio, she told them her ex-boyfriend had been stalking her and had recently shared some disturbing information with her 12-year-old daughter. On one occasion, Zach wanted Olivia to see her mother on the couch with Rosalio in a compromising position. He instructed her to place her shirt over her mouth so she didn't leave breath marks on the window pane. She told the officer that before they left, Zach pulled over, got out of his car, took his shoes off, and went to Rosalio's car. Olivia saw him take something out of the car and take a photo of the license plate. On another occasion, she saw her father remove a phone he had hidden in an AC vent inside Sadie's home. And when he got back into the car, he began playing the recording from the phone and was disappointed when nothing could be heard. Zach had also shared a plan with Olivia on how they were going to punish Sadie. On one of the nights when Zach had the children and Sadie was out with Rosalio, He was going to drop the kids off at Sadie's house. Then he was going to have Olivia call the police and say that she was scared and her mom had left her all alone with her four-year-old twin brothers. You see, Sadie was a licensed social worker who was employed by the county. He was hoping that this would cause her to lose her job as well as custody of their children. On another occasion, while Olivia's mother was in Mexico and on vacation, she was staying at her mom's house. Her mom's friend Rebecca was staying over to take care of her and her siblings. Olivia remembers waking up in the middle of the night with her dad standing over her. He refused to leave, stating that her mother had abandoned her and her siblings. He called Sadie in Mexico at 3 a.m. her time and demanded that she return home. Sadie had to call the police to finally get him to leave her home. In court, Rebecca also explained the details of this situation and explained how she woke up to a dark figure sitting on the edge of the couch and questioned her where Sadie was, 
who she was with, and how he was surprised that she was not with her, whoring around. Now, on the weekend of May 16th and 17th, Olivia told investigators that her father drove her and her brothers around in his Dodge minivan. They went to visit their grandfather's farm and then went back to their dad's house while they waited for their mom to come and pick them up. And when police asked if she noticed anything different about the minivan, she said it appeared normal. During that weekend at her father's home, her little brothers were playing with Legos. When one of them dropped the Legos down the floorboards into the basement, he asked Olivia to go down and get it for him. When she went down to the basement, she noticed her dad had a new office chair on rollers. The chair had rope and duct tape sitting on it as if it was in preparation for someone. Later, police believed that Zach tied Rosalio to the chair and wheeled him out to his van through the back patio, which opened onto the parking lot. Rosalio was over 6 feet and 240 pounds at the time of his disappearance. She also noticed that her father had gotten rid of 72 of the marijuana plants he was usually tending to. She thought it was odd that the plants he cared so much about were suddenly gone. It was as if he was preparing for a search warrant. This was the same night that Rosalio would later go missing. He also asked her to watch the computer for her mother's whereabouts. He had hidden another tracker inside their son's booster seat. On the 19th, when police were called to Rosalio's apartment, they immediately knew his wounds were not survivable based on the type of pattern of the blood spatter. Numerous patterns of blood come from blunt force impact. There was also an area covered in arterial spray. Among the bloodstains were small splintered pieces of wood found throughout the apartment. In addition to the blunt force trauma, police believed a knife could have been involved in the attack. This would explain the arterial spray from a large open wound near a major artery like the neck, heart, or leg. Police discovered that Rosalio had returned home on the night of his disappearance at 9.08 p.m. He had plans with another woman he had met on Facebook, and that night was going to be their first date. Her name was Narita Macias. She told officers that when she arrived at the Wood Creek Apartments, she got lost and went to the wrong building. She went back to her car and began texting, letting him know that she was there, but had gone to the wrong door. After about 30 minutes without a response, she decided to go home. She texted him several more times, but never got an answer. Investigators didn't know where Rosalio's body was located, but they were sure he was dead and Zach was their first suspect. But he wasn't just their first suspect. Two of Rosalio's friends, Michael Campbell and Brandon Hendrickson, also thought Zach was responsible for their friend's disappearance. On the morning of the 19th, they showed up at Zach's house looking for him. Sensing trouble, Zach pretended to be his brother, then called the police for help. It was good timing because the police were interested in speaking with him as well. The day earlier on the 18th, they discovered surveillance video of Zach at Walmart as soon as it opened. It was the day after Rosalio went missing after his apparent fatal encounter inside his apartment. Zach parked his minivan in the back of the parking lot, far away from any other vehicles. Then he went inside and purchased gloves, bleach, trash bags, and a tarp. When police arrived at his house, they discovered burn pits still smoldering in the backyard. And later, forensic investigators would discover remnants of a bleach bottle and Zach's clothing. Of significance was the fact that they found burned buttons that matched a fleece-lined flannel jacket that Zach wore regularly. They were unable to find that jacket anywhere in Zach's belongings. In addition to the two smoldering burn pits, they found that Zach had almost $50,000 in cash in his possession. Police believed that he was going to use this money to flee in case he was suspected of Rosalio's murder. But the most important evidence of all was found in Zach's minivan. Olivia had already told them that there were no significant changes to the van. But when they examined the van, the entire van smelled like bleach. There were bleach spots throughout the carpet, and the back quarter of the van had its seats removed, and all of the carpet was removed, leaving the exposed metal flooring. 
What was more telling were the things that they couldn't find. They couldn't find the missing seats or the carpet from Zach's minivan, and they couldn't find the items he purchased at Walmart, and they couldn't find the chair on rollers with duct tape and rope sitting on it. Now, Zach offered an alibi, but it quickly fell apart. At first, his girlfriend, Christine Rumsberg, said that Zach was with her all night. They had watched a movie, and he spent the night. To explain away his Walmart purchase, Zach stated that he was working on renovating a lake property, and those items were to help with the demolition. However, Christine's sister helped her, quote, remember that Zach didn't come over the night Rosalio disappeared. Christine showed officers text message exchanges and phone records where she asked him what he wanted for dinner that night, called him over five times, and then eventually told him at 11 p.m. that she was going to sleep. She also told officers that it was her who had Zach's other car, an Audi, which he said he had been driving on the 17th and not the Dodge minivan. Investigators also discovered that the phone he usually used wasn't answered or moved from 7.30 to 11.19 p.m. on the night Rosalio disappeared. They also weren't able to locate the roller chair, rope, or duct tape that Olivia had seen in her father's basement on Sunday, May 17th. They also learned that Zach slept over Christine's house four to five nights a week. But on the night of the 20th, Zach wanted her to sleep at his house, which was a rare occurrence in their year-long relationship. When police first questioned Zach about Rosalio's disappearance, he pretended not to know who they were talking about. Yet on his computer, he had a file folder with Rosalio's name. The file contained photos of Rosalio, including his work and his home address. There was also a map with a pin over Rosalio's home, along with a photo of two GPS trackers he purchased from Amazon. Forensics were able to locate one spot of blood in the back of the van where the carpet had been removed. And that spot of blood belonged to Rosalio Gutierrez. At first, Zach was placed under arrest for two counts of stalking based on testimony from Olivia. However, by December of 2020, his charges had been elevated to first-degree murder, two counts of stalking, and one count of hiding a corpse. Zach was convicted by Kenosha County jury in March of 2023. The prosecutors portrayed him as a jealous and obsessive man who couldn't allow his ex-girlfriend to move on without him. Despite an overwhelming amount of evidence against him, he was still defiant and professing his innocence at his sentencing hearing. How much time do I got? Well, um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Oh, you mean how much? Oh, I misunderstood. I've had people give us a different version. Not that that version. Um, How much time do you have to talk? Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you a reasonable period. I mean, this is one of the major events of your life, so you're certainly welcome to uh, speak. I'm not going to say it's unlimited, but uh, you're welcome to uh, tell me what you think. Speak from your heart. I don't want to go into all the details of the case. I got a lot of dispute about what was said, what was portrayed. I think the facts, with a little more scrutiny, tell a much different story than what the jury decided. And I don't think that that... uh, I don't think that things played out fairly. I think that there's some things that are not just from our side, questions outstanding for both sides. And I don't think the court accomplished what it set out to do in any means if both sides are left with so many questions. And I don't think uh, without going into the case, I don't think we really got to the heart of the matter. What I can tell you is I didn't kill anybody. What I can tell you is, I didn't stalk anybody. And what I can tell you is, I didn't dispose of any corpse. It's really weird to be sentenced for, or convicted for it, and soon to be sentenced for it, but I didn't judge. It kind of feels like there's no turning around on that now. I don't really know how to make a better statement of my opposition. But I disagree, I'm innocent. I don't know what you're gonna decide. I don't know what you're all gonna weigh. I don't even know how to represent my own character without having my family be able to testify on my behalf. It's no surprise that Zach once again failed to take responsibility for his actions. 
What he is referring to about his family testifying on his behalf has to do with the victim impact statements. Zach wanted his family to be able to describe his good character and plead for mercy and leniency, something that Judge Bruce Schroeder wouldn't allow. Victim impact statements are limited to family and friends of victims, not family and friends of the accused. This wasn't an appropriate time to beg for leniency. This was the time for those who are mourning Rosalio's loss to address his murderer and his despicable actions. One of those people was Sadie Beecham, the woman he didn't want but also didn't want to move on without him or to be happy. In her statement, she said, quote, I never imagined this would be my life. Then she apologized to her own daughter and all of Rosalio's family for Zach's actions. Olivia Anderson gave a statement, too. She asked her father if he ever loved her or if she was just a pawn, a toy, or a loyal golden retriever who lapped up any attention he provided, no matter how small. She said her father's abusive patterns would have a lifelong detrimental impact on her life. She said it had taken her to a dark place and she has had to work hard to get her confidence back. Then she told him that it was frisbee weather something that they had previously enjoyed together. She ended by telling him she had worked hard over the last three years and he would have to work even harder if he ever wanted to have her back in his life. Rosalio's mother also gave a moving victim impact statement. She said, quote, My son's blood was all over the front living room space with his blood spatter on the children's drawings and family photographs. My only son was taken so savagely. Her biggest source of grief is that she still doesn't have her son's body back, and she has been unable to properly lay him to rest. Judge Schroeder told Zach, quote, What you did was frightening and horrible. You can wag your head all you want. The jury found beyond a reasonable doubt that you did it. And so, the loss of these people is beyond measure. Then he sentenced Zach to two years in prison for two counts of stalking, an additional six years in prison for hiding a corpse to be served consecutively, and sentenced to life in prison for first-degree murder with the possibility of parole. He is eligible for parole only after he serves 40 years in prison, which he will be at the age of 82. He was also given credit for the 1,092 days he already spent in custody awaiting trial. Zach's defense attorney, Nicole Mueller, believes the court convicted an innocent man. She has vowed that Zach Anderson will appeal his conviction. Today, the memory of the victim lives on in the hearts of those who knew and loved him. And for the woman at the center of this tragic tale, she still bears the scars of Zach's actions but refuses to be defined by them. As she rebuilds her life, her resilience serves as a beacon of hope to others affected by similar senseless crimes. And for Zachariah Anderson, his destructive actions have led him to a life behind bars, stripped of his freedom. The once free man is now confined, left with nothing but the echoes of his decisions. His story stands as a stark warning of the dangerous path that jealousy and control can lead to. A lesson that society will remember for years to come. And this completes this week's episode of Crime Salad. Thank you so much for joining Ricky and I. We really appreciate you listening to us. If you really like the show, please make sure you subscribe and leave us a supporting review so that our show can grow a little bit more. But again, thanks for listening and we will be with you next week.